all hits all the time. We are family. Max Scherzer, double digit case. We're busting ours to kick yours. Fun to watch. On 15. Respect all, fear none. Into the upper deck. Intensity is not a perfume. What is up, everybody? Welcome into the Maths and All Access podcast, of course, brought to you by Marymount University. Visit MarymountSaints.com to learn more about our student athletes and programs today. Bobby Blanco, Paul Mancano, back with you talking Nationals baseball during this offseason. And Paul, last week, we regraded the 2019 offseason that eventually led, of course, to a, a World Series championship and a parade downtown, which is a lot of fun. Uh, today, we're going to kind of look ahead to this offseason. Um, I know it's a, about a month underway already um but there are free agency signings already happening um teams are picking up players the nats have a handful of free agents leaving this roster some of them big names some of them not so big um but we just want to before everyone starts moving <laughs> and although we know this market is super slow we, every, before everyone starts moving we kind of want to preview see which players uh could the nationals could consider bringing back at what values stuff like that um and just kind of give the lay of the land of this nationals uh, free agency class and the Nats hold a lot of cards actually in this free agency period because they have so many of their own impending impending free agents so mm -hmm. many of these guys that um, they had on the championship roster are now free agents so before they it, it kind of like last year with Bryce Harper the Nats went out and signed Patrick Corbin before they really had any idea what Bryce Harper was going to do I still think Mike Rizzo in this front office is going to be aggressive in terms of addressing their needs regardless of where an Anthony Rendon or a Steven Strasburg might be um, but the Nats have to evaluate in-house before they evaluate outside and look elsewhere in the free agency pool and there are so many areas um, where they can either so many decisions they can make where they can retain somebody and then they won't have to delve deeper into the free agency market or maybe they just you know they decide to let somebody walk and replace him with somebody or maybe it's out of their hands. They think they have somebody locked up uh, on their own team, um, and then they have to adjust. So they are kind of right in the center of this free agency market. Yeah, when you're the World Series champions, I feel like you know the baseball world, especially during the offseason, kind of looks at you. It's like, and there's always a question with the championship teams: Do you retain everybody and make another run at it, or you know, especially for this Nationals roster, they kind of hinted at that they're just, they were a little older. They were the oldest team oldest roster in all of baseball obviously to, and then they all ended up winning but there are some tough decisions to make with some of these guys do you let them walk do you bring them back you already have guys who are on long-term deals that are on the other end of their uh their careers yeah. so you have to take that into consideration obviously we know about the luxury tax that the, the learner family does not want to go over that tax again even though if they were to do it since they didn't do it last year if they were the penalty is nowhere near as severe so that might be a factor too but there are a lot of factors not including obviously the whole baseball world looking at seeing what they're going to do because again do you make another run at it do you try to retain this championship roster or do you have to kind of I don't want to say rebuild, but restructure it yeah. a little bit in order to stay competitive while also, you know, being f financially responsible. Yeah, I think one thing is clear is that they do have to get a little bit younger. And that'll I think that'll just <laughs> kind of happen naturally because yeah. we're going to go down this list. There are so many guys here. They really can't bring all of them back. Um, you know, it, it just does would not make sense for them to do so. So I think that they're going to have to mix and match. They're going to have to retain some guys from that team and let other guys walk. Um, and you mentioned the luxury tax being a factor. It, it is, I, I don't know if they're willing to delve back into it. I would guess not at this point, but that tax, that penalty being reset is absolutely massive so that if they really want to retain straws and Rendon and go after maybe another top free agent, they could in theory do so if they're willing to delve back uh, into that tax. And then the other thing to consider is, they have a couple of young guys on this roster who are years away from um, even arbitration. Right. But once they hit that, they're gonna need. They're gonna require quite a lot of money. Yeah. Um, Juan Soto and Victor Robles being the most obvious of those two. So Trey Turner on that list as well. And Trey Turner was closer um, to that free agent mark uh, than 
uh, those younger two. But, th- you know, if they want to retain those guys down the line, they have to start budgeting for that now because we know that Juan Soto is going to get a uh, pretty pretty steep pay increase when that day comes. Yeah, yeah, and obviously Agent Bing's got Boris. You know, you know, people look at what the Braves did with Ronald Acuna Jr. and Ozzy Albes and how they extended them, you know, it's easy to say, well, why don't the Nats just do that as well with guys like Soto and Robles? Yeah, I mean, ideally, yes, get them now long term and for quote unquote cheaper than they will be eventually. But the way, especially Juan Soto, the way he's played his first two seasons, I mean, I know he wants to make his money now. He said time and time again, he's like, he's sick of being poor. Like, he wants to make money. Totally understand that. But he, the. The longer he holds out, the more that paycheck is going to be. Yeah. I mean, he is going to be due so much money when his time comes. Why not just wait it out? Yeah. Unless he just really feels comfortable here and wants to, you know, settle down, sign long term, get an equal pay, fair pay, but he thinks on the lines of like an Acuna, um, and then just kind of ride that out. And then maybe it's all depends because like, we've seen like, and we're talking about guys, but like Steven Strasburg, he didn't want to hit free agency the first time he was up for it. So he signed an extension. Andy Rendon probably ideally would have wanted to avoid this upcoming offseason as well, but didn't work out that way. Where does Juan Soto fall in that? And and obviously Robles too. Do they want to, you know, just kind of ride it out and then test those waters? Or do you want to be locked down in the same place for years to come uh, while you're still young and in yeah. your prime? And on the national side, I think by now we know we're, we're about 100% certain that Juan Soto, unless, God forbid, injuries, uh, happen is going to be a superstar. He already is a superstar. Right. They know that, and he's going to be that for a long time, maybe 10 years plus. Victor Robles has is an excellent young player, plays excellent defense in center field, has flash power, has flash speed, but you don't, you can't predict six or seven years down the line, and that's what they would be doing when they'd be locking up somebody who this year was a rookie. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's hard to see that far down the line. So, you know, if those guys hit their ceilings, you would be getting a bargain, but you never know. There could be injuries along the way. Um, there could be something that derails them um, at some point. So it, it is tough on their side to make that kind of financial commitment that many years out. Soto, understandable. I, I totally, you know, if they want to, they probably should want to try to get him locked up at some point um, uh, on the early side because you know what you're getting in him. Yeah. Um, you, can, you can project him years down the line. But for a guy like Robles, it's a little bit less certain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's also, you know, it does. we brought it up because it does play a factor into these discussions we're about to have about this free agency class because, again, when it comes into fin- the finances, do the Nationals want to commit long-term money to these older guys yeah. or guys that have been around longer when they know that they do want to lock up a Juan Soto, Trey Turner, Victor Robles down the line as well? So, yeah, it's all kind of intertwined, but let's get in the list of the right here, right now, yeah. this free agency class. Obviously, the one we have to start with, Reigning World Series MVP, former number one overall draft pick, probably the highest prospect ever to come out of the national system other than Bryce Harper, and that's Steven Strasburg. Uh, 31 years old, of course. He opted out. Uh, he signed a seven-year extension back in, I believe, 2016. He has four years remaining on that deal. I decided to opt out after having a stellar season, his most complete season he's had probably as a national that was capped off with a World Series MVP. And what a, I, I, you know, I'm sure Nationals fans won't like this, but you have to give uh, Scott Boris props for, uh, the way that he constructed that contract, um, which was giving Steven Strasburg a player option after this 2019 season and after the 2020 season. Mm. And he signed this contract at a point where he was still an excellent pitcher, but there were still concerns about his injury history um, and whether he would ever reach that peak. So he locked him in for X number of dollars if he wanted it. Those seven years, that guaranteed money if he wanted to have it. And then he gave Steven Strasburg the option of if you're even better than you have been in the first however many years of your career, you can opt out after either one of those seasons. If you have a career year in 2019 if you, or if you have a cre- career year in 2020, you can opt out and then get a ton more money. And it worked out. I mean, Strasburg had a career year this past year. Uh, you know, there's always going to be a market for a World Series MVP. Yeah. Uh, in addition to the fact that he finished fifth in the Cy Young race, um, 18 and six record, 3.32 ERA, 10.8 Ks per nine, uh, and, and absolute career year for Strasburg. Gave him the perfect option to get out of uh, the remaining years on his contract. And if I remember correctly, reading up on this, preparing for the episode, 
Steven Strasburg, the Nats don't give out player options. They, I mean, Mike Rizzo and company, they don't see it. It doesn't help the club because it gives the player all the power. Exactly. This was the first player that they said, okay, and this is their first player option that they allowed on a contract extension. And, you know, you got to wonder, obviously, it's, it being Steven Strasburg, a former number one overall pick that they've taken, the guy they've groomed, the guy they've done right by his entire career. Obviously, they shut down in 2012. That paid dividends. Look, at, look in 2019, how he, he played it all throughout this whole season and the postseason. But, I mean, it's you're right. It, it, he gambled, not gambled on himself, but like this could not have worked out better for Strasburg and yeah. Boris because the first year of his opt-out, he's already, you know, whatever the remaining money was for the next three years or four years, whatever it is, he's already going to make deserved more than that just from this one season alone because it was a career year he didn't really miss any starts you know he won 18 games i think led the national league in wins um yeah i think he made all pot available starts that he didn't miss yeah, any time which yeah. was obviously huge for him and that's like the key like you mentioned that's a guy with a long long injury history um and, and track record of of not being able to perform when all the you know when all the aspects or everything has to be exactly right for him, and he totally shook that. And he's honestly he started that a couple of years ago, back in 2017, that Cubs start in, in the NLDS. But this year, obviously, went above and beyond all of that, um, and now has earned himself that the right, obviously, to go chest the waters and try to. Everyone now assumes that this probably is a, is a way for. Strasburg just to restructure that deal the next four plus years remaining on that contract and just get a little more money than he would have gotten had he stuck with it yeah I think I think it's kind of uh this is the one I think you know obviously and we'll get into Rendon but I think people think that Rendon could still return to the team but with Strasburg I think absolutely this team uh they kind of this is viewed by many in the national media market as this could be the the one that they really retain. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a above 50% chance. I do want to get your percent chance that you think he's going to return to the Nats. Okay. Every, every time, every day that this goes on without him signing a, a deal with the Nats, um, makes, you know, builds this, these question marks. But, um, I think that, uh, ultimately they will, um, decide they will be able to retain him. The pro- MLB trade rumors projection has six years, one hundred and eighty million dollars is the projection. That's just an idea. Um, I would say there's a seventy, I would maybe eighty percent chance that they uh, that Strasburg returns to the Nationals. And, and Steven Strasburg too. He's he's the type, and we talked about this over the past couple of years. You know, we talked about this with Bryce Harper last year. We talked about it at length with Anthony Rendon heading into this free agency, this this offseason. But with Strasburg, there just seems, and everyone we've talked to in the Nats media also seems to agree, there just seems to be this sense of comfort here at home in, in, in D.C. Um, you know, he moved his entire family from San Diego, where he grew up and obviously played college baseball, to Washington, D.C., um, he spends year round here now in the area. You don't do that if you don't plan on being here very long. You know, yeah. why bother? I mean, and now also, too, so deep into his career, now he finally decided to do that, um, to move to this across the country. Now why would you want to just kind of pick up and leave, go somewhere else? Again, I think it's just more of, you know, now he has leverage. Let's kind of restructure this deal. This is where I want to be. We can maybe give me a little pay raise after – I helped you win a World Series and, and yeah. was named World Series MVP. You said 70, maybe 80. I'm, I'm leaning more towards cl- closer to like a 90. Like, I think there's a very small chance. Like, it would have to be some other team, and it would have to be the perfect location too, like San Diego. San Diego, like the Padres. <laughs> but, you know, why would he want to go, besides obviously being in your hometown and playing in seven degree weather every day and, you know, having Manny Machado as your, and uh, Tatis as Tatis. your infielders. But, you know, I, it'd have to be someone just dropping a huge amount of money, maybe even overpaying him, I would say, and then the Nats being like, we can't match that. I, I just feel like they're, they're already, and we've seen reports I, I, as early as, you know, this is Wednesday or Tuesday night, saying that it's possible that the Nats re-signed him before the winter meetings, and right. that's in a couple of weeks. So it, it might happen sooner rather than later. I'm giving it a really high percentage chance that this this happens. Yeah, I would say, uh, I mean, at least at least 70% for me. Um, so it, that is uh, at least positive. It was, uh, you know, oh, oh, it was 
kind of a wake up call. What two days after the World Series Game Seven, when yeah. he decided to opt out, um, and that you know a little bit of panic wave, I would say, through the, the Nationals community. But um, I still think he's coming back. 30- but we all knew that was coming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it. Uh, we knew either that was going to happen or they were going to settle it in house where the Nats were just going to tear up the deal and say, let's give you this extra amount of money. Right. You know, without um, having to him technically testing free agency. Right, right, right. Um, all right. Next big one. Got to talk about it's Tony a big Rendonis. one. It's a big one. Uh, he is 29 years old, coming off a uh, pretty awesome season. Finished third in the NL MVP voting. 319 average, 34 homers, 126 RBIs, which led the National League. Gold Glove finalist. He, of course, rejected his qualifying offer. MLB trade rumors projecting him to sign a seven-year, $235 million contract. He, uh, another guy who had an absolutely career year, the the best year possible for him, wins a World Series, comes up huge in the World Series and every step of the playoffs. Could not have had a better year right before uh, his free agency. Yeah, it's, you know, it was kind of, I don't want to say it's the worst case scenario for the Nationals, but it's one of those things where, because for so long, and kind of along the same lines with Bryce Harper, even though we knew Bryce Harper was going to touch free agency, Anthony Rendon seemed like the kind of guy that didn't want to do that. Yeah. And, and he said all along, he was open to talks during the season, before the season, he would, be, he would listen. Um, I think... Two things really happened that really hurt the Nationals' case in this thing was, one, obviously, the Nolan Arenado extension before the season. Uh, he got eight years, $260 million. Um, and then, two, the way Anthony ended up playing this season at an MVP level, finished in the top three, and carried this team. And we talked about it, I think, last week even, how much this team suffered without him. Those couple weeks he was out earlier on the season, that kind of led to that 19-31 and 31 record. And then from there on, I mean, he he was a driving force. I mean, he was the best player on this team throughout the whole season. And like you said, no, what better time to have your best season, as, also as a homegrown guy. I mean, obviously, they love Anthony Rendon. Mike Rizzo says that ad nauseum. But, he, he, I mean, when it mattered the most, this was the yeah. season to have his best season, and he did. And now it's kind of like, you know, all right, here we go. Pay me. Boom. And, and uh, you it's know. It's the complete opposite of what happened to Bryce Harper because he had a very okay season last year. Some might even say bad yeah. before he entered free agency. And we might remember that there were a couple times during the season where re- uh, reports came out that they were meeting with Boris. Boris mm-hmm. was at the ballpark. Boris was talking to the learners or Mike Rizzo um, discussing a deal. But as the season went along and we were seeing the kind of year that Anthony Rendon was having, it became, you know, it it became more and more obvious that he was going to wait this thing out. We know that Boris clients, you know, when possible, they will wait uh, till the last possible moment. We saw with Bryce Harper last year before they signed a deal, they want to make sure that they're, they're getting the absolute most. And as we were seeing, oh, he's having an MVP caliber season that, you know, it, it became it made less and less sense for him to sign a deal right. earlier on. Yep. Um, but also, I will say, and this is not to at all to say that he is leaving, but you would always, as a Nats fan, trade him leaving because he drew up his value. He, you know, his his value went so up because he won a World Series and helped you win a World Series, and he is ultimately out of the Nationals' price range. I'd rather have that World Series championship than. X number of player eight years with a, another player. right right I mean you would never <laughs> it's trade worth it if it you know? right I mean you love Anthony Rendon but I mean yeah. you would never trade no World Series for another seven years of Anthony Rendon right than a World Series yeah and exactly possible I mean again it's not definite too so it's right. possibly yeah, seeing course. him walk out the door I, I think the one thing now here too also and and he's talked about this so many times and I I even thinking back out on it like. There, there's some writing on the wall too. He is such a home guy. Mm-hmm. Like he loves Houston. He loves being in Texas. You know, I, I'm thinking back to the All Star game where he he didn't go to the All Star game. He was elected to the All Star game and he decided not to go. He just went home, you know, and yeah. chilled. And went to and the Nats baseball youth baseball camp. Oh right, he did that too. Uh, but you know, there's a team in Texas that could draw his interest in in the Rangers. I feel like, and that's a team that was going to be like, here is a blank check. You know, come play for us for the next seven, eight years, and we will pay you however much of your money. And that, I, I do feel like that, though, he does like, Anthony does like being here. He likes being a national. He loves the fans and, yeah. and, and the city, obviously the team that drafted him. 
Um, so I think it, when, it, when it comes down to it, when he eventually gets these big offers, he will come back, kind of like the, what, how we saw the Bryce Harper reported last year, how it kind of worked out, yeah. and say, can you match this? And if you can, I'll, I'll stay. You know, that I think that's a strong possibility. That's why I'm going to give it maybe a... Man, it's tough to put a percentage on this one. It is really tough. There's so many factors. Personally, I would go less than 50 at this point, but yeah. not by much. I would say 40. I was going to aim. I started at 45%. Yeah. Maybe. I'll give it 50-50. Okay. I'll wow. give it Just because, right down I, because also, you know, from the Nationals perspective, yes, he won, helped you win the World Series, but can you really afford, like, to let your two superstars walk out the door in back-to-back years? Like, I, I don't know how that, that will sit well with fans. Obviously, winning the World Series helps. Mm-hmm. And there's two schools of thought. Well, he helped us win the World Series. Let's lock him up long term and help go win more. Or, hell, you helped, you helped us win a World Series. Thank you for your time. Good luck in the future. Yeah. And it's it can, but also, can they afford to hand Steven Strasburg and Anthony Rendon mega deals right. in the same offseason? And then, well, and if you do, that obviously, of course, detracts from elsewhere. Right. And then there are other factors like, uh, you know, how would they replace him? They could, of course, you know, sign a, another free agent, whether it be Josh Donaldson or somebody else. and Or would you have to look long-term in your own organization? Maybe you, uh, Carter Keboom is an option at third down the line, but also they have a hole at second. So there are, there are all kinds of things. I, 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 I would give it at this point 40 to 45% just because I don't know. I think they're going to make Strasburg a priority at this point. Um, keeping him in house, and I just don't know if they will have um, the ability to give Rendon what he wants at this point, especially considering how much this organization leans on uh, deferred money in contracts as well. Well, he also that, that's that's gets a good point, and we, I mean, I'm guessing Anthony's not going to really fall for that. Uh, but also to point out too is like, I don't want to say they're in cahoots, but like, you know, could theoretically Steven Strasburg be like, hey, just give me a slight. Pay bump, but not outrageous. That way you have some more for Anthony. I want Anthony on my team. I'll come back if Anthony, and vice versa. Like Anthony's like, hey, you know, pay me fairly, but don't overexert yourself. So let's let's keep this team, this core together for, you know, as long as I'm here. So we're contending to win the World Series every year that I'm here. Right. So, I mean, that's always up to the player. Obviously, Scott Poor's being both our agents. It's unlikely. But, I mean, we've seen players do it before. I mean, it's just like you don't overpay me just so – you don't want to be that player that puts your team in a bad financial situation, you know, of course. where, and then you're th- therefore putting your team out of contention because they can't afford to buy players around you. Exactly. All right. Next up, Ryan Zimmerman, another guy that, uh, I put in the same kind of category as Steven Strasburg, lifelong national, uh, face of the franchise for several years, obviously for his entire career. He has been the face of this franchise. He's 35 years old. Uh, 2019, another uh, injury-riddled season. Played just 52 games, hit 257 with six homers, 27 RBIs. But once again, came up huge in the playoffs. Hit a wor- a World Series home run in Game One, um, and uh, the Nationals uh, declined his 18 million dollar option for next season. But Bobby, I got to put this one uh, up up to 90 percent, probably 95 percent at this point. I'm gonna say almost 100 percent. Yeah, like it's it's just almost a foregone conclusion. He Ryan Zimmerman basically said it so as much yeah. at the end, near the end of the season. He's like, I'll be back. And, you know, honestly, he did himself a favor. He, he You said how well he did in the postseason. He also played pretty well down the stretch when he finally came back. Mm-hmm. You know, he started swinging the bat pretty well. And you know, he showed that he still has some left in the tank. Now, this decline in the option, obviously, that saves them. I'm going to guess he comes back for a couple of years, maybe like one like one or two years, like I a think million, he wants, a, yeah, I think million a piece. Reading his comments, I think he hopes to have at least – Two years. Two years. I would say, yeah. Yeah. It could also be, you know, a, a year with the option for a second year, a million a piece, and with some incentives in there. So they, they, there, you're saving yourself $16, 17000000 million yeah. on, as opposed to the option. You know, it's, I don't know what other teams can be looking at Orion Zimmerman to, to invite him in and bring him in. I mean, it would more likely than not probably be yeah. an American League team, a team where he could platoon at first base and DH. Um, but I, I, I get he's, he's I can't imagine he's on too many other teams' radar right now, and he is obviously squarely on the Nationals' radar. Where right. he's like, we have our we you know, we know we can't play every day. It's we'll have to platoon him with somebody else, like we've been doing the past couple of years. But he still has baseball left in him. He's a fan favorite. He's the face of the franchise. Let's bring him back uh, for however brief and for however quote unquote cheaper. And I think he means more. 
uh, to the Nationals than he does to any other team. Yeah. And the Nationals mean more to him than uh, any other team would mean to him. Out of all these guys on this list, he would definitely be the weirdest to see in another uniform. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, I can't imagine it. No, it would be, it it'd would be, be, it'd be like bizarre. Heart stopping. It'd be yeah. like, oh, heartbreaking. Almost as weird as seeing Bryce in a Phillies right. jersey. Almost. All right. Uh, sticking to kind of that right side of the infield um howie kendrick is obviously another big name for this team this one has a little gray area too yeah nlcs mv nlcs mvp um played really well dave martinez did a phenomenal job of stretching out his day so giving him the right time off because we knew he was coming back from uh, achilles injury um he also proved that like ryan zimmerman that he has some baseball left in the tank too to me, it's he's he's like Ryan Zimmerman, just kind of the opposite in that you know he is on other teams' radar. He's going to get interest, especially from American League clubs, because we saw how good of a DH he was in the World World Series when they were played in Houston. He can play both positions at first base and maybe even a little second, but probably more first base and DH. He's def- and we've already heard that he's drawn some interest from American League clubs. If he gets signed by another team that's not the Nationals. He is not going to play second base on a regular basis. I think that is pretty much clear yeah. at this point. Um, we at saw 36. we saw some of his defensive uh, shortcomings, of course, in the playoffs. But yeah, he's thirty six. He coming. <laughs> remember, this year he's coming off an Achilles injury, so he is still not um, going to be an av- above average defensive infielder. That no matter what position he plays there. Um, but what an offensive year at the plate: three forty four average, seventeen homers, sixty two RBIs, NLCS MVP. Uh, Big time homer in game seven, uh, game tying. Was that the game tying or the go ahead? That was, that was the go ahead, go ahead home run yeah. in um, game seven of the that World Series. Ding. We're off the pole. Uh, MLB trade rumors projection two years, 12 million. Two years sounds like a good price uh, uh, length uh, for him. That seems to make sense considering that would take him through his 30, age 38 season. Um, but yeah, I think he. I think it would make the most sense for him to go to an American League ballpark uh, and club where he can be a DH, uh, then that will be his set position. Yeah. Um, it would make still some sense, of course, for the Nationals to bring him back just because of what he can do at the plate. But I think that they're probably leaning towards somebody who has a little bit more defensive versatility at this age, a little bit more of a plus defensively at this age. If they're going to bring in somebody to be a um, guy off the bench like Howie Kendrick is, who can play a few different positions, somebody who's a little bit younger maybe, uh, I remember last year they were talking about Marlon Gonzalez as an option. Somebody in that mold, I think, who is a more of a defensive-minded player, a little bit on the younger side. Yeah, it's a player at first base. It's, it's crazy to think, thinking back on it. Remember in uh, the NLDS against the Dodgers, and Howie Kendrick made a handful of errors, and mm-hmm. and it, it was tough to put him out there every day. I think you're right. It makes way more sense for him to be a DH every day and substitute in at first base when necessary. Um, so an American League club just makes two more sense. I agree also that the two years is about about right. He's 36. You figured he probably has a, two solid seasons left in him. And after that, if he wants to keep swinging the back, by all means, let him. But he can probably still play good ball for the, at least two more years until he's 38. Yeah. Um, and, and the $12 million cost, six per year. That's I mean, that's it's not prohibited by any stretch. No, no, no. But that might be just a little out. Especially like you said, with the Nats trying to upgrade, mm-hmm. maybe in that area, and yeah. maybe give a younger player an opportunity at first base with Ryan Zimmerman, if bringing him back, you know, it, they might be looking more. For, they're at a crossroads right here at first base because they might be looking more for. We might need a more long term permanent solution yeah. as opposed to kind of just piecing first base together between Zimmerman, Kendrick, Adams. Yeah, um, you know, bring in someone who can fill in with Zim and then finally take over whenever Zim eventually retires or leaves. I just remember the NLDS in the middle of game five, our good friend Jamal Collier of MLB.com tweeting, this has been a forgettable series for Howie Kendrick. Yeah. And within like four innings, he made him look like an idiot because (laughs) he hit a grand slam, you know, in the 10th inning. Uh, No big deal. But yeah, uh, I I would put this number percentage-wise for the Nationals probably around 25 to 30%. I was going to say 20 Okay. Yeah. Twenty yeah, percent. Um, I don't. Which and of course, oh, you know, any guy that does has is a postseason hero for you. Um, is sad to see go. Right. Um, it's it's going to be you know on the the heart in you once you know wants to see him back, but of course the Nationals, if they're thinking with their brain, would know it uh, probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, and if 
if Howie really wanted to come back, I'm sure he can make something work out. But right. I mean, he'll ha- he has in- he already has interest, so yeah. he'll find somewhere else to go. Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, next up, Daniel Hudson. This guy, I think, will be fairly coveted, actually, in the reliever market, of course. Uh, the Nationals traded for him midseason. Um, he was not expected to be the closer, but down the stretch and during the regular season, he pretty much was the closer as Sean Doolittle hit some snags. And then he and Do kind of split time in that closer role um, in the postseason. 32 years old uh, in the regular season, 24 games with the Nats, 1.44 ERA, and 6 of 8 in terms of save opportunities. MLB trade rumor projection, the same year and dollar amount as Howie Kendrick, two years, $12 million. Personally, I think he could get a little bit more than that. I know relievers are kind of shaky year to year. They're just kind of more of a gamble than position players or even starters in that realm. Um I would put the Nats' chances of retaining him pretty high. They still have the same exact concerns in the bullpen that they did at this point last uh, offseason. They still had the worst bullpen ERA. He was very excellent for them down the stretch. He was on the mound when they clinched Game 7. I think that they're going to do what they can to try to bring Hudson back. I would agree, too, but you have to look back, you know, we we gave Mike Rizzo kudos for being active early last offseason when no teams were being... Yeah. It was really quiet. The hot stove was cold as ice. But none of those really panned out. You know, Kyle Bearclaw, obviously Trevor Rosenthal, they never really ended up becoming the guys that they thought they would be. You have a guy now in, I know he's a free agent, but in-house that you know what you have. And, and unfortunately, maybe this season kind of proved Mike Rizzo's theory of not relying on relief pitching and really help relying heavily on starting pitching. But as we saw early on in the season, I mean, they had the worst bullpen ERA in all of baseball. You, I mean, the worst bullpen to ever make the postseason and win the World Series. I mean, you may be lucky, whatever you want to call it, but, I mean, you, you can't expect to continue to do that. I think we're at a time where the, the Nationals need to really start spending on that bullpen. I, I don't think they can continue to survive and succeed like they have been this past year, winning, meaning the World Series, by just piecing together the bullpens and, and making minor trades at the deadline yeah. every year, year in and year out. You have Sean Doolittle, lock up Daniel Hudson, and also look at in division. The Braves are already signed two relievers, two of the top guys on the market. So the market's already thinning for relievers. You have a guy again that you know what can do, you know who what he can do in house, and like like the uh, MLB uh, trade rumors projects, fairly. Reasonable price tag, yeah. so I'm sure they could make something work there. If they get were able to get him at six million dollars a year, they paid Trevor Rosenthal seven million dollars a year last year, and yeah. they were taking a big gamble on him considering he had missed the entire previous season, and right. they had just seen one workout with him, and they, he was the first real big signing of uh, last off season. If they were to get Hudson for less than that average annual value, that'd be pretty impressive, um, and that would be that would just be a much 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 better value. Um, considering you're getting a a much better player at this stage. Uh, So I would put Hudson's percent chance to return to the Nats maybe 70%. 70? I was going to maybe say like 60. Again, it's it's Mike for me. There will be need for him, uh, you know, uh, around the league. Yeah, and and there's always need for uh, relievers. But also to me, uh, the reason I'm going a little lower Mm -hmm. is just because, again, Mike Rizzo's philosophy is of emphasizing starting pitching as opposed to the bullpen. So, and obviously he's going to need to get relievers. He might be hesitant to go all in on, you know, a 32 year old um, who, even exactly. though he pitched great, but he might be, you know, giving him a couple extra years, especially when, you know, Sean Doolittle's 33, I believe. So yeah. he's already got some age in that bullpen. So I'm going to go a little lower just because Mike Rose has a track record of, you know, let's, let's, let's see what else we got. Another tough one to predict is Brian Dozier, 32 years old. Uh, this season, I would say he wasn't quite the guy that they expected him to be when they, he signed that one-year $9 million deal with the Nationals. He had had, of course, a great career in Minnesota and then had struggled last year when he was with the Dodgers. Um, he hit two thirty eight this year with 20 homers and 50 RBIs, so the power numbers were fine, um, but that two thirty eight average was not good enough, and we saw that Davey Martinez clearly did not trust him in the playoffs. Um, because yeah. he he opted for his Drupal Cabrera, who they picked up for next to nothing in August. So Dozier, I would say, odds are he's on his way out um, of D.C. I think that he proved he's a fine but very replaceable 
uh, offensive and defensive second baseman. They still the the thing is though they still have a hole at that position, right? And they probably have to use free agency to fill it. They might have to go with another bridge contract. It, you know, if they retain Anthony Rendon, they might say, "All right, Keyboom is our second baseman of the future." It's the same conversation we had last year. Do they go with another bridge guy for a year, or if you know Rendon walks, they said, "Okay, we now have two uh, infield positions that we need to fill. Maybe we'll go out and and spend a ton of money on a second baseman, um, and maybe shift Keyboom to third. So this is kind of a a it, one of the many dominoes that are going to fall. Right. But I think. Pretty much, no matter where how you slice it, I don't think it's above a fifty percent chance that Dozier's back. Yeah, it's the kind of the caveat that we should have maybe addressed before we started the conversation. But like you said, the dominoes, you know, one domino falls, that changes everything. Exactly, you know, the whole field of this conversation and how these percentages we're giving these guys. So, yeah, if Anthony Rendon returns, I think Brian Dozier's percentage goes even way down because they'll just say, "All right, well, let's just stick with Keyboom at second. We have our infield now." Um, but if Anthony Rendon doesn't return, what if the Nationals decide to switch Keyboom back to third and say, okay, we, now he's our third baseman of the future. We need a placeholder for second base again. Why not bring back Dozier again for a year or two yeah. while Keyboom continues to get ready and we now look for our, our second baseman of the future? Um, yeah, so that's obviously something to consider too. It, again, it's interesting. I, I kind of agree that I think Brian Dozier's percentage is probably sm- lower, 32. We did talk about, though, you mentioned he didn't have a great season, but... I think we, last week we even said, you know, he did what he, he was average. You know, he was, he hit his average 20 homers, 50 RBIs. That's okay. You know, it's not terrible, but it's not fantastic, but it's, it's on par yeah. for, for Brian Dozier. And you'll take that, I guess for, for only $9 million. Um, I can't imagine they would bring him back for that same similar price after the year he had again, just being average. Uh, I, I think it's still low, but other factors, if something changes again with that infield, whether it be Rendon or elsewhere, you know, that could fluctuate. But I think it's right now right real low as of today. What did you say? A below 50%. Below 50? I would say maybe 35 say, to 40. Okay, I was going to say 30. 30, okay. 30 35. Gotcha. Um, and that, that obviously changes if you yeah. know, something else changes. Exactly. All right, next up, uh, Jan Gomes, another guy that uh, is 32 years old. 97 games behind the plate, 223 average, 12 homers, 43 RBIs, 31% caught stealing. Nats declined his $9 million option. Of course, they traded for him uh, last offseason, and he started out pretty slow, uh, offensively especially. Kurt Suzuki gets hurt right near the end of the year. He steps up. Kurt Suzuki gets hurt in the World Series. Gomes steps up again. So he was called on uh, to split that spot um, with Suzuki, and that was you know a, a clear, clear directive from Mike Rizzo is we're going to spend more money and upgrade this catching position because the last two years, in 2016, or in 2017, 2018, with Matt Wieters behind the plate, it just was not enough. They were not getting enough production behind the plate. Suzuki probably had a slightly better year than Gomes, but Gomes was also part of that um, big time upgrade um, behind the uh, the plate. So, question is, do the Nats try to retain Jan Gomes as a secondary option once again to Kurt Suzuki, or were they not quite as satisfied with what they got from him and they'll try to to sign somebody else? I think it's something they'll entertain. Um, I think you have to. Just because, again, it's someone in house. You know what you have. Him and Suzuki were, you know, for whatever Jan Gomes was, him and Suzuki were a phenomenal upgrade from what they had a couple years before, like you mentioned. So, uh, you need someone to platoon with Suzuki. He's not going to be able to play every day next year. Uh, Jan Gomes now has a year under his belt with his pitching staff, um, and we also talked about last last week how he, when when Suzuki went down, he was actually pretty good yeah. when he had to fill it. And he was catching almost every day, you know, except for maybe a handful of days off. So I think it's something to entertain. The $9 million option, Mark Zuckerman mentioned on his uh, end-of-year player recap for Young Gomes being like, it, it's something the Nationals probably will entertain, maybe bring him back on a more affordable deal. But if, you know, if it doesn't work out, they do have to address the catcher situation again because again Suzuki yeah. can't be the main guy for all of next season um so it might be something where this could be like we know what we have it's easy it's just get it done and then that way we're not stressing about catcher next year we can focus on bullpen rendon 
Yeah. First base, second base, whatever it may be. And there are a couple factors, I think, kind of working against him. One is he didn't work great with Max Scherzer. Kurt Suzuki yeah. um, had a two... It had, uh, Max had an ERA two runs lower when he was pitching to Kurt Suzuki as opposed to Jan Gomes uh, during the regular season. He worked great with Patrick Corbin, and that yeah. was clear that uh, he was Corbin's best uh, favorite option to have behind the plate. Um, but... It's, it, it, you know, his defense was not spectacular. Um, and you're already, you know what you're getting in Kurt Suzuki. It's not excellent defense behind the plate. He did not throw out a ton of base runners. Um, so would they try to go with somebody who is an ex, you know, not doesn't bring quite what uh, Gomes does at the plate and maybe go with somebody who's better at throwing out base runners? I feel like we see this, like every offseason, is this carousel of catchers just going around. <laughs> yeah. Like all of these guys just circulate every two years. They're on a different team. Um, so they're like the same. I looked at the free agent group of catchers and it's very similar um, to yeah. the group that I see like every year. Where yeah, it's yeah. like a Russell Martin and Yasmani Grandal who was there last year. So um, I think that Jan Gomes is, is very tough to predict here. I think there's maybe a 45% chance they bring him back. Yeah, I was going to say maybe 50. Just uh, the consistency factor, like you said. Yeah. Because like it's kind of a, a carousel, you know, or like a revolving door. Maybe just get some consistency back there, especially if you bring Strasburg back. Then you're keeping your starting rotation consistent. So might as well keep the catching group that caught them all last season consistent as well. And then that's one step you don't have to cover yep. in in spring training and throughout the season and worry about communication and stuff like that. So they could be on the same page from the get go. Um, like Mark mentioned, you could probably get them on a on a relatively cheaper deal. But then again, someone could also, you know, so there might be some other team out there who's like, hey, we need a placeholder catcher or someone for our young catcher to look up to uh, for, the, for the next season. We'll give you $9, $10 million for yeah. the year, whatever it may be. But it wouldn't surprise me if this one also gets done kind of quickly. Like if they address the catcher situation kind of quickly, and it being Jan Gomes specifically, because again, in-house, you might have a little more leverage being the team that he was just with. Be like, hey, just, just come back for, you know, real quick. Exactly. All right. Another guy above the age of 30, all of these guys, with the exception of Anthony Rendon, are 31 or older, by the way. Uh, Matt Adams, 31 years old. Uh, 2019, he hit 226 with 20 homers, uh, 56 RBIs. He signed a one-year, $4 million deal with the Nats before the season. Of course, it was his second season with the Nats. Didn't put up quite the same numbers that we saw in 2018, um, and the Nats declined his $4 million option for next season. Four million dollars is uh, not a whole lot for Matt Adams. We no. talked about it last week on the yeah. podcast, so that was maybe a little bit surprising that they declined that. He, it, you know, they're going to need somebody else who can play first base. Matt Adams seemed to kind of fit that, but maybe they want somebody who is a longer term piece um, that will eventually take over that spot after uh, Zimmerman eventually retires. Right. You have your like I mentioned before, you have your Zimmerman, you have your Kendrick, and then Matt Adams is just third on the list. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, but again, he's a guy who he performed very well in place of Ryan Zimmerman again this season when Zim went down. The 20 home runs, 56 RBIs, kind of like Dozier. Like that's for a backup first baseman, you, you would take that every single time, especially if you're paying him relatively cheaply. So it was, this might be more of the one of uh, thank you for your time. We appreciate it, but we're going to move on and try to find another, you know, if Zim coming back, we're going to try to find another someone to platoon with him at first base. Um, the Kendrick, Kendrick might affect this a little bit because the Kendrick end up do, does end up signing elsewhere, which I, well, we both agree might, is probably the case. Then maybe Adams, may, then maybe the Nats can turn to Adams. And go, okay, well, we, we know what you have in you. Lefty power bat. He also did struggle once when Zimmerman came back, but that might just be a lack of playing time. Yeah. Um, and he didn't wasn't a factor at all in the postseason. So, um, you know, it, the, the market could dictate where – the NASCAR just returned to him. Like, all right, you know, he might be like their fail safe. You yeah. Know, it's like no one's jumping the gun to get Matt Adams right now. You know, he's on, he's not on top of anybody's list. So they could wait out and he'll be still be available to sign in February before spring training, whatever it may be. And if they need him, they can jump the gun right there and be like, all right, here, come back for a couple mil. Whatever exactly. It may be. One of those guys that is just kind of hanging around and that yeah. they, they were able to pick. That's, that's kind of how it was last year right. um, with him. Yeah, it's it's tough. I, I would say it. There's probably a better chance that he resigns with the Nats than goes elsewhere. Yeah, 
But I don't think it's an above 50% chance that he re-signs with the Nats. I think it's just because they declined him for a $4 million option, which was pretty cheap. I would say yeah. there's maybe a yeah, 40, 40% chance. That 40, 40%. 40%. Chance. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Drupal Cabrera, 34 years old, uh, picked up for next to nothing, basically. Uh, signed with the Nats in August after he was released for the Rangers. Uh, Nats were only on hook for $170,000 of his contract. And then, of course, you look into the World Series, and there he is starting every day. Um, he hit uh, two, uh, 323 sorry, with six homers and 40 RBIs in 38 regular season games with the Nats. Um, was not exactly the, you know one of the heroes of the Nats postseason, but he was solid for them uh, when they needed him to be. So, as Drupal Cabrera, the, again, one of the many dominoes in this infield, Maybe he's a guy that they decide to bring back. He is 34, though. So if they decide to go for a longer-term piece, um, I think that it's likely that they don't bring him back. I think the only scenario they really bring Esdrubal back is if, you know, they re-sign um, uh, Rendon and they want to get another bridge at second base. Right, and for Similar cheap, to Dozier, for yeah. Cheap, right, yeah. And I think what really hurts Esdrubal right here is his age, 34 years yeah. old and playing the infield second base. I mean, he's not much younger than Kendrick, and we can talk about how Kendrick's age is really up against him too. Um, but what the thing that he does have an advantage of, he's a switch hitter, and that's why he played so much in the postseason because he was able to play better second base than Howie Kendrick would have been and also could have faced lefties and righties either way. Um, and we saw how well – I mean, was it um, – was it? no who, uh, Granky? Granky. He had great numbers against Granky, and he he slugged him a couple times. He faced him in the World Series. That that worked out really well. Uh, but yeah, I agree. It's I think it's a situation where it'll the market will dictate whether where he'll fall because he's not on top of anybody's list due to his age. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a track record too of long term. Like he yeah he hit three twenty three in thirty eight games for the Nats, but we have a longer track record of what he is. He's more more often than not, just a placeholder at most spots. So, if he yeah, if they sign Rendon and they need a second baseman on the cheap for the next year, he's definitely a possibility. We know David Martinez loves having him as a, a available on his roster. So, but no one's jumping the, to get as Drupal yeah. Cabrera right now. He'll be available if you want to wait until end of January and February. Exactly. So I would put this on the lower end. I would say that there's maybe a 25% chance, maybe okay. 30% chance. I would say 25-20. Just, yeah. again, the age to me is just like, you know, I, all right, fine. We're in spring training and we need a second baseman. Come on back. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. There are other options for them to explore that I think they should explore too. Exactly. I think he's even lower on the list than a Brian Dozier would be. Yeah, and I think that's also due to the age. You know, yeah, he's exactly. five, three, or four, four years older. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, uh, last sad, up. Sad news. <laughs> it's sad. It is sad news, um, but last up, the guy last on our list is already gone. 32-year-old yep. Gerardo Parra, baby shark, has... Uh, Swam the Pacific and uh, headed over to Japan. He hit 250 in 89 games uh, during the regular season. Eight homers, one of them being Grand Slam against the Dodgers back in May. 42 RBIs. He signed with the Nats in May after he was released from the Giants. Davey Martinez credited, gave him a lot of credit for helping the Nats uh, maintain their, their calm and their focus and their day-by-day attitude uh, to get back. Uh, certainly sad that uh, he leaves. Not terribly surprising, um, and he got a, a pretty solid contract going over to Japan. Yeah, two million dollars guaranteed, plus uh, five hundred thousand dollars in bonuses and a three million dollar vesting option for twenty twenty one. He was not going to get anywhere close to that in the major leagues. Now, what he could do though is take this contract in Japan, and, it, and funny he signed with the the Giants of Japan, so he got dropped by the Giants early the season, played yeah. for the Nats, now the Yumi Yori Giants, the Yumi Yori Giants of the Japanese Central League. But so no, what he could do, and it's very possible too, because how old is he? He is thirty-two. That's not that old. He could go play in Japan for the next year or however, whatever two years, whatever it is, and then, you know, obviously the level of play isn't as high as it is over here in the major leagues. Have a couple of really good seasons, put up home run numbers, put up an average, whatever it may be, and then use that to get another major league deal. I can see him being back in the majors in the next like two or three years um, in kind of a similar role, a, just a bench player or a, as a, as a player that, you know, a team suffers an injury and they need someone like to, to come to play outfield or a corner outfield spot 
in the pinch. Exactly. You know? So um, I, I, it's sad to see Baby Shark leave because he meant so much to this team and obviously became a huge fan favorite. And David Martinez, you know, was talking about how uh, the energy he brought every day was just so vital for the Nationals in their postseason run. But almost at the same time, I'm happy for him because he's getting a chance to play every day. He's going to get paid pretty fairly. Um, and, again, a contract that he d- I don't think he would have found um, no. in, in the U.S. And he would be another guy that we mentioned that would just be kind of hanging around by the start of spring training and would get picked up by uh, a team and, and probably bounce around during the season like he did this past year. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, you got to be happy for the guy. Yeah. I mean, that is uh, it's great to see. I, I'm a little upset, too, I'm, I'm myself because uh, I don't know if you saw, but over the weekend I got a baby shark. I know. I know. From my grandmother, who was – I thought to, you were going to – uh, it's in my car. I, in. I left it in my car, and Brutal. you stole the close parking spot this morning. So I had, <laughs> I to park, did. I had to park so far away. Yeah, we. I, I was scoping that. I was going around. Yeah. I was circling it like you would if you were a shark. Ah. Uh, and uh, but you, I thought you were actually going to slide in and steal it. I was about to, but then I saw. Oh, yeah. When you said you were looking, for, I was like, no, you can. I mean, I have been there having circled that parking lot looking for a spot yeah. and not being able to find one. But anyways, it's it's. Okay, t- it's two things. It's really cool, <laughs> but also because it's tempo based. So okay. the faster you like chomp, the faster the song plays. And then uh-huh. also, if you go sl- if you slow it down, it's also creepy because when you stop, it's playing and it has to wind down and it starts singing like <laughs> this, and it's like that's yeah. demonic. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah, um, but it is adorable. I, my grandmother gave it for me. It's a great post World Series championship gift. Um, and I will always remember Baby Shark. Uh, he turned millions of adults into the biggest Baby Shark fans ever. So yeah. kudos to uh, Gerardo Parra and uh, good luck in Japan. I remember the uh, somebody tweeting during the World Series <laughs> when they were doing Baby Shark. He came in a pinch hit. They said, when your grandkids ask you about the 2019 World <laughs> Series, show them this video. And it's the entire ballpark doing Baby Shark. Yeah. Definitely a Guinness World Record there. So good for Parr that he got his money and he's going to get to play every day overseas. Um, but overall, uh, the Nats have those two top of the guys, those t- first two dominoes. They may not be the first to sign, but they are the two biggest dominoes. Yeah. Um, and I think the the infield situation is going to be fascinating to see because they can mix and match any way that, uh, that they see fit. Um, in terms of retaining a certain number of guys or letting certain number of guys go. So uh, the Nats still, like we said at the top, I think they they hold a lot of the cards. Everybody's eyes are on them as free agency opens. Yeah, and uh, I don't want to understate how much. I think Carter Keeboom is going to play a big factor into this. How much, I mean, I know he played really well at AAA. He did not play so well with his brief stint with the Nationals this year, but how much can they rely on him being an everyday player? Now? Is he ready to take that step next season? And if so, that means that they can focus elsewhere and not have to worry about an infielder, whether it be third or second base, uh, and and focus yeah. elsewhere. So it's going to be, I think, Mike Rizzo is going to really have to rely on his scouts and how they believe in his yeah. coaches and the minor league system, how they believe if Carter Keebum can make that jump next season and be an everyday major leaguer. And it's different from the Bryce situation where last year we knew we had Soda, we knew he had, he right. had uh, Adam Eaton and Wright, and they knew they had... Victor Robles in center, and they, you know, Victor Robles was still somewhat of a question mark, but they at least had Michael A. Taylor to back him up, and they were more certain, I think, um, at that point that he could step in. So they had an outfield set when Bryce hit free agency. The infield is not 100% set, right. and they still have a hole at second base at this point um, in addition to a hole at third base. So it's not, you know, if they just had a hole at third base – you might be much more comfortable letting Rendon walk and just sliding Carter Keboom into that spot, but it's a little bit less so. Yep. Like you said, the Nationals have a lot of dominoes that can fall, and, of course, they will have ripple effects when they do, and we mm-hmm. will be there we will. to talk about it and cover it when they do. So make sure you're following along with the Mass and All Access podcast. You can follow it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and SoundCloud. Check it out on the Mass and All Access Facebook page and the Mass and Nationals YouTube account. Also check us out on Twitter, at Bobby underscore Blanco, at Paul Mancano, and at Mass and Nationals for all your Nationals content. The Mass and Nationals, oh, excuse me, the Mass and All Access podcast is brought to you by Marymount University. Visit marymountsaints.com to learn more about our student athletes and programs today. For Paul, I'm Bobby. We'll catch you next time.